Good morning, church. Good morning, City Church. If you're new to City Church, City Church is one family, one church family. We meet in five different locations in four cities. And so uh, we stream our services to all of our locations. So we're just welcoming every location right now, Middletown, Bridgeport, Hartford, and North Haven. And here we are in New Haven. So can you put your hands together, church, and just say hello? Good morning, church. Welcome. It's amazing what we can do through technology, and uh, we're grateful that you've decided to join us. If you're new, my name is Justin, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm thankful that you have taken some time to hang out with us this morning. Mark chapter 6 is where we're going to be. If you're new to the Bible, the Gospel of Mark, uh, written about the life of Jesus, one of the four Gospels that we have in the New Testament. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 6. We've been in a teaching series called The Standard. Whether you and I realize it or not, We live our lives based upon standards that we've adopted from the people around us. And so maybe it was your dad, maybe it was your grandpa, maybe it was your uncle, maybe it was a celebrity, maybe it was some other famous person or historical figure, but your entire life you have been collecting standards about everything in life. How do I think about money? How do I think about time? How do I think about uh, things? How do I think about everything? And so we've been looking for the last few weeks at the life of Jesus and how Jesus sets for us a standard or a model for how to think about these things. And so we've looked first at how Jesus interacted with God. And we found that Jesus interacted with God in a world-shattering way. He came to this earth and he taught us that we can know God as Father, right? And then we looked at how Jesus interacted with people and how he interacted with things. And that was last week. And today we are going to look at how Jesus interacts with time time. And so if you have a Bible, Mark chapter 6, we're going to start at the end of a story, verse 45 and 46. Immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately. That was good. Oh, you were definitely doing good already. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. He went up on the mountain to pray. I want to talk to you today on the topic of the rules of time. And if you want to jot some notes down for your reflection later this week, the rules of time. That's what we're going to cover this morning. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you that you have created unique and powerful rules about how we should think about time. I pray in Jesus' name that as we study the text today that you would open up our eyes so that we could see your rules about time. And I pray that you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do you consider yourself a good time manager? Do you have certain things that you use to, uh, to ensure that you manage your time efficiently and effectively? Maybe you use your phone. How many people you keep track of your calendar in your phone? Let me see your hand. Yeah, lots of us do. And then maybe some people you've got a, a paper planner, right? Like, a, you know, like, a, like a, a planner that gives you months and calendars. Or maybe you use like a Google calendar where you get online and you can see all the things you're doing and what you've committed to. We all have these different strategies when it comes to managing our time. And in our culture, we talk about time and we say that you're supposed to spend time and save time and try not to waste time and budget your time. And what we find is that our paradigm of time looks a whole lot like we're talking about money, right? Spend, save, budget, waste, because in America, time is money. Time is seen as a commodity, something that can be spent and something that should be saved. And so that's our perspective about time. It's a linear perspective that says there's only so much and you've got to budget it. And that just seems normal to us. In fact, most of us haven't even considered the fact that that's the paradigm in which we view time through. But other cultures have a different perspective of time. For example, if you go to some Arab cultures or if you go to maybe to Spain, you'll find that the perspective of that society as a whole is much more relationally uh, driven, that it's not so much about getting there on time and ending on time, it's more about making a connection. 
You go to some Asian cultures and they'll have a very cyclical or circular view of time where they say everything goes around in seasons and so if it's not this time, it can be next time and so they may take a few more laps around the pool and consider things before making a decision. But in America, we manage our time, right? We manage our time. And most of us, if we're honest, don't have quite enough. Come on, somebody say amen. Yeah, it's true. Like, you don't have quite enough. You know, one recent study found that the number one factor contributing to excessive stress in the lives of Americans was busyness. Are you a busy person? Busy, always rushing here, rushing there. Maybe you rush to work in the morning. You fight traffic the whole way there. Then you rush to get lunch, and then you rush back to the office. You rush to make an appointment, and then you rush to get home, and then you rush out to some evening commitment, and then you rush to get to bed, and then you finally get to bed, and then you rush out of bed in the morning, and you rush to church here this morning. Come on, let's just be real. And you're always rushing. You're always yelling at some other person that you don't know in a car nearby, always pushing, always trying to get there, always fighting the clock. And you do all these little strategies. Come on, I know you do. I set this one five minutes fast. I set this one 10 minutes fast. Me and my wife, when we were first teaching our kids about time, we would go in and change their clock so that they would stay in bed longer. Don't tell my kids. You know, like, ding, 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 you know, like, and so they're like, no, it's only 6 a.m. It's like 8.30 in the morning. It's like, you guys got to stay in bed, you know. Uh, but, uh, but time, we're always pushing, you know. Come on, you did that too, don't judge me. <laughs> time, always pushing, you know, always trying to be there on time. And it's interesting that in our society, busyness is like a badge of honor, you know. You talk to somebody, you know, you say, hey, how's work going? <sighs> What's the answer? Busy, man. Busy. <sighs> busy. I'm busy, busy, busy. You're not busy? <laughs> I am, right? Like that's just, that's just like, you know, when we hear busy, we think, oh, he must be important. He must be doing something significant. There must be a great demand on that individual. He's so busy. And so in our world, busyness is often seen as, you know, affirming my value. And so we champion how busy we are. But some of us aren't that busy. There's another side to the spectrum here in our culture. Some of us aren't busy at all. Some of us are just straight up bored. And you go to work and you're bored. And you go to school and you're bored. And you come home and you're bored. We live in a society that thrives on constant fascination. And so you must fascinate me in order for me to stay engaged. And so if I don't like the topic, I'm bored. If I don't like the show, I'm bored. I need a phone in my hand so that I can scroll through something so that I don't, you know, become bored. You know, I go to work and I'm bored. I go to school and I'm bored. I go to church and I'm not bored, right? I'm not bored. But I might be later bored. And so we're always fighting, you know, this idea of boredom and just trying to be entertained just a little bit more. I've been going through this process with my kids where they're getting to the age where I can start to show them some of the movies that I watched as a kid. And so we've gone through a number of different movies that I have forced them to watch with me. And the most recent one that we've been going through is, uh, is the 1980s films Back to the Future. Come on, anybody. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Back to the Future. Maybe you didn't get into that. That's fine. When I was a kid, they were big. And so Back to the Future is a story about Marty McFly, this teenage kid, and his friend, Dr. Brown. And they invent, well, really, Dr. Brown invents a time machine. And so the three films go through this incredible story of these guys traveling through time. And first they go back to 1955 by accident, and Marty messes up the moment where his dad meets his mom, which is very bad for him, obviously, since now they won't meet and he won't be born and everything else. And so he has to fix that. And then they have to go to the future to help Marty's family in the future with some issue. And then they end up going back to 1885, and they get stuck back in time, and they got to figure out a way to get back to the present. And so these three films kind of, you know, cry chronicle their journey of time travel. And on the outside, it's really just a fun 1980s movie with cool 1980s music and, uh, and a whole lot of fun. But on the inside, many of us, if we think about it this way, are living our lives like Marty McFly, living our lives in such a way that you're always trying to get back to some past experience, always trying to relive those days 
Or maybe you're here and you're always waiting for some future reality, never satisfied right now, always looking to some future goal to say, then I'll be happy. Once I have that, I'll be satisfied. Once I get there, once I am married, and once I retire, or once I get out of this job, or once I buy this house, then I'll be satisfied. Or I wish it was like then. I wish it was like before they passed away. I wish it was like before they moved. Living in the past or living in the future. And so what ends up happening is you end up not really living at all. Just distracting yourself with a constant scroll of things on your phone, disengaged from the people around you. And in our attempt to be really alive, we never fully exist in the present. And this is a disease in our world. It's a disease that you and I have all experienced. What if... What if, let's just try this thought on today, your time management philosophy, and you might be here like, I don't even have a time management philosophy. Well, that's your management philosophy then. Your time management philosophy is nothing, right? But you have some form of time management. It might be watching the sun going, okay, time to go to bed. But either way, you've got some strategy, some type of time management philosophy. What if your time management philosophy was causing you to miss what was most important in life? The life of Jesus is once again for us a model or a standard of how to think about time. And you've got to think about Jesus in a way that no one had quite the perspective on time that Jesus had. Because here he is claiming to be God. And we believe that he is in fact God. And so he is the I am. That's the Old Testament name that God gives himself. When asked what his name is, he says, my name is I am. Which of course is a name that's connected to time, right? He says, I'm past, I'm present, I'm future. God stands outside of time in what theologians call the perpetual present. And of course this blows our minds because we are hours and minutes and seconds, but God is outside these things. He can see the beginning. He can see the end, living in the perpetual presence. So a million years ago is just like now to God, and a million years from now is likewise just like now to God. And so he sees it all. He is the I am. And the I am put on skin and lived in the confines of minutes and hours. And he brought a unique perspective to how to manage and how to think about time. And as you study the life of Jesus, what you'll find is you can never find a moment, get ready New England, where Jesus is rushing. He's just never in a rush. But he's always on purpose. He's not aimless, you know, scrolling his Instagram feed. He's not just wasting time. He's always on purpose and on mission. But he's never aimless, he's never uh, empty, he's never feeling like he doesn't know where to go. And we see him constantly, his plans get interrupted, and he doesn't flinch, he doesn't panic, he doesn't freak out, he just begins to move with the new plan. He lives and acts as if he has an unwavering confidence that his life is being guided by God. And we watch him all through the scriptures, and I've for years now studied the entire New Testament, looked at the life of Jesus and said, how does Jesus manage his time? And what you see is that this man who thought differently about time in three years of ministry accomplishes more than any human being has ever accomplished in the history of the human race, fulfills over 300 Old Testament prophecies, dies on a cross for the sins of the world, rises from the dead, and becomes the most famous and influential person in the history of our existence. And it's in that truth that he shows us a different perspective on time. And Mark chapter 6, I like is that, to think of it as like a collection of different moments where we get a glimpse into Jesus' thoughts about time. And so I want to look at that story together as an illustration of Jesus' philosophy when it comes to how to think about time. And so we'll start in verse 30 of Mark chapter 6 and hopefully begin to see a little bit clearer from his perspective. You ready? Oh, you all just got super quiet on me? Yeah, you good? Okay, all right, all right, good. This is like a group participation moment here. You you can say yes. Verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Now, if you know the context of the story, what's happening right now is Jesus sent his disciples out on a mission to go and preach about him and pray for the sick and, uh, and see them recover, work miracles, and they go out and they do that and they see miracles. It's the first time they ever do this. It's very exciting. And so they come back to Jesus and they're stoked. I mean, this is a moment of great momentum. People all over the region are buzzing about Jesus and about his power and it's exciting and they are very, very excited. Now, if you ever read any leadership materials, they 
will tell you that when momentum gets going, the key in that moment is to sustain that momentum, right? And so they've got momentum. And so this is a moment where they should be like, hey, let's do this. Let's like, let's start Jesus Ministries International. Like, let's launch the 501c3. Let's get this ball rolling because now things are really moving. This is our moment. What do we do, Jesus? We're here to take over. We're ready to march on Jerusalem. Let's do something significant. And look at how Jesus responds to this incredible moment of opportunity. Verse 31. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. What? That's not the moment for a rest. When you got the momentum going, that's the moment to push. I mean, any stockbroker, anybody in any sphere will tell you once momentum gets moving, it's the time to launch new things. It's the time to really excel. And yet Jesus in this moment says, actually, it's the time to pull back. Do you ever struggle to pull back? Come on, turn to the person next to you and ask them. Do you ever struggle to pull back? If it's your spouse and you already know they do, look them in the eyes with real convicting you know, eyes and just say, do you ever struggle to pull back? Do you ever struggle? I know I do. I struggle to pull back. I don't know if it's just the culture we live in or if it's just me, but I have a real problem pulling back. Once we started this church, you know, I was like 80 hours a week working all the time. And some of you guys think working all the time. You only work for like two hours on Sunday, right? It's like, well, there was a lot to do back then. I don't do anything now, but there was a lot to do back then. And, uh, and I was just always buzzing and pushing and, and working a million hours and, and just exhausting myself. And a few years ago, I started meeting every month with a, a pastor who's much older and wiser than me. And we meet monthly, and he just kind of checks up on me. We meet for an hour, and we just talk about what's going on in my world and, and how I can kind of uh, get things under control and not you know, lose my mind. And so he, 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 we've met now for four years. And just a few months ago, we're sitting there talking, and I'm telling him that I'm just, you know, I'm exhausted. And he stops me in the middle of me talking, and he says, have you... <laughs> Have you ever stopped and wondered why we keep having this conversation? Why now for years we keep going through this and why you keep pushing yourself to a place of exhaustion? Have you ever stopped and just asked God, why do I do that? I was like, no. I haven't really asked that, but maybe I should. Scripture says that they had no leisure even to eat. You know when you start neglecting the basic necessities of life that you're pushing too hard. You know when you don't have time to eat, I'm talking to somebody right now, when you don't have time to sleep, when you keep being like, man, I know I need seven, eight hours to sleep. Some of you in the room are like, I know I need nine or ten hours to sleep every night, but I don't got time for that, I don't got time for that, so I'm, dude, I'm, I'm Edison, give me four hours, I'll be fine. And you try to push and you try to be okay and you try to take some no-dose or drink an extra cup of coffee and you're exhausted. And it goes on and on and on. Why do we do this? Interestingly enough, when you research the life of an individual that's pushing so hard, what you'll find is most of the time those pushing so hard have created a self-inflicting issue. They're, they're creating that requirement on themselves. They're pushing themselves to that limit. No one else is demanding that of them. And God's been showing me for years now, but maybe he wants to show you too. Maybe, maybe something in you has attached what you produce to what you're worth. Maybe something in you thinks that if I stop pushing, I won't be worth anything anymore. Maybe your value as an individual is tied up in your production. Jesus has a solution for that. I like how he says it in the Message Bible in Matthew 11. He says, are you tired? That's a question for you today. Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Jesus says this, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. See, Jesus here is teaching his disciples what we'll call the first rule of time from the perspective of Jesus. And you can jot these down. I'm going to give you four today. The first rule of time is this, the rule of limits. And the rule of limits says this, to maximize your potential, embrace your limitations. To maximize your potential, embrace 
your limitations. Now, this is countercultural because we're taught in our society, stretch your limits, live beyond your limits. And so what do we do? Well, we ignore Sabbath, right? The Bible tells us that a healthy rhythm for life is to take a 24-hour break every seven days. 24 hours to pause, to not work, to pray, and to play, and to enjoy life, to turn off your phone, to stop checking your email. And I would say that if we're honest, probably somewhere around 90% of the people in this church don't actually do that. That we say, oh yeah, 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 I've got a day off, but it's not a Sabbath where you truly pull away and seek the Lord because you think that that's some old idea that doesn't apply to you. You've got to be available 24-7 because you're so busy because you're so important, right? And if I let go of that busyness, maybe I won't feel so important. What is it in you, come on, I'm talking to you right now, that keeps fighting against the limits of your own physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional state? What is it in you that keeps pushing and stretching those limits? Well, this has been a problem for a long time. It's not new with you or me. This problem has existed since the very beginning of the story. The first book, the first story in the Bible is about Adam and Eve and how they're put in a garden where they can thrive and flourish, but God has created for them limits, right? And what do they do? They do not, I'm talking to you right now, they do not trust the intentions of God. They doubt the intentions of their creator, and they think the limits of God will stop them from experiencing some level of happiness that they could obtain if they break them. And so they break the limits of God thinking that the guardrails he created were to limit them, when in fact the guardrails he created were to keep them from falling off the cliff. And they discover in breaking the limits that God's intention for them was not to limit them, but to bless them. His plan was not to minimize their potential, but through limits to maximize their joy. Oh, wake up, wake up in the balcony. So maybe, I'm not gonna make you raise your hand, but you know who you are, maybe your busyness is a subtle act of rebellion against God's pattern for life. Well, we just dropped it there. Maybe your busyness is sin. Well, now busy's not that cool, right? <laughs> Look how the Apostle Paul talks about his limits. I love this in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, we, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but we will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. In other words, what he's saying is, I can't do everything, but God has given me a particular sphere. You know, he's given you a neighborhood to live in. He's given you friends to connect with. He's given you family members. He's given you a job that you have people that you know in that job. Your sphere of influence is unique to you, and no one else has the exact same sphere that you have. You have a sphere of influence, and God says, be faithful to that sphere, and I'll expand it. Be faithful to that sphere, and you'll see miracles happen. But when you try to live beyond the limits of what God has given you and put in you, you end up exhausting yourself and ruining your opportunities. The rule of limits, to maximize your potential, to maximize your potential, embrace your limitations. We doing okay so far? Verse 33, now... Many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So what happens is Jesus and his disciples go away to rest on the boat, but the people, the crowd, follow him on land and end up where he lands the boat. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. Hold on a second, Jesus, you just broke your own rule, right? Like Jesus is here teaching his disciples to rest, and now he's teaching again. He's teaching again. See, you and I have a tendency that as soon as we learn a rule from God, we make it into a law. As soon as we learn a rule from God, we become legalistic and make it into a law. This is why the Pharisees couldn't do Sabbath right in the Old Testament into the New. Because they made it a law. They made everything that God was teaching them as a principle, and they made it into a legalistic law that earned their righteousness. I'm talking to you today. And so what ends up happening here is we see Jesus seemingly bending the law or the rule that he just created, the rule of limits. Why would he do that? He did that because he saw something. He saw something. What did he see? It says he saw the crowd. They were like sheep without a shepherd. But he saw something in the spirit. 
What he saw is what we'll call today a kairos moment. Can you say that word kairos with me? Go ahead and try it. Kairos. Yeah, kairos. Of course, this is a Greek word, so it's not going to make much sense to you on the outside. But in the Greek language, which is what the New Testament's written in, they had functionally two words to talk about time. In our culture, we really just use the word time. But in their culture, they had two words. The first was chronos, and this is the word we're comfortable with when it comes to time. This meant measurable time. Think chronological, right? And so the Greek word chronos just means accounting of time. So minutes, hours, day, what time is it, right? It's 11.59, it's 12.52, it's, you know, it's 8.30. That's time, okay? So that's chronos. But there is a second word that the Greeks had to explain time, and this was the word kairos. And the word kairos could literally be translated the right moment. The right moment. One translator makes it out to say the supreme moment. The supreme moment. And so in your life, there is Kronos, and within Kronos, there is Kairos. Let me try to explain. So uh, you think of Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, right? They still teach about that in public schools, just making sure. But uh, November 19th, 1863, Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address, right? That's Kronos. He does it on that particular day, at that particular time, in that particular year. That's Kronos. But if you know much about the story of this speech, this three-minute speech transformed the Civil War from a political power struggle to a moral quest to end injustice. It ignited a deflated and defeated Union Army, set on fire the heart of a nation, and eventually propelled the Union to success. See, it was a Kairos moment within the Kronos of life. You tracking with this? So what Jesus is showing us here is, yes, I agree with the rule of limits, but you must also understand at the same time a second rule when it comes to your time, and that is the rule of supreme moments. And the rule of supreme moments says that God hides Kairos in Kronos. And you must become an expert at seeing the supreme moment, the moment where God wants to move. See, Jesus was so good at this. He'd be in the day-to-day -day routine, sitting at a well, and a woman would come by, walking down the street, and Zacchaeus calls out to him, hearing that Lazarus had died and walking into the tomb of a dead man and rising from the dead. Jesus took Kronos moments, just the average routines of life, and he made them into Kairos opportunities, supreme moments, divine moments where God intervened. And what you need to see in your own life See, this will solve your boredom, by the way. If you're here and you're kind of drifting off and mildly bored, this will solve that problem for you, all right? Because what you'll discover is while you're sitting at the cubicle at work, while you're bored out of your mind in some class in school, while you're walking down the street, doing your normal routines, eating breakfast at a restaurant, when you're doing the normal day-to-day -day chronos of life, there are kairos moments hidden in there. And if you just open your heart to it and open your spirit to it and even ask God to help you see them, you'll see God in your life start working miracles in the normal routine routines of every day, and you'll start seeing people restored, marriages restored, hearts healed, hearts open to God, lives turned to Christ, miracles breaking out, the sick healed, the power of Jesus, the life of God, and you won't be bored on Instagram anymore in Jesus' name. Oh, it gets kind of exciting. I know a couple people even smiled. We're getting there. We're getting there. The rule of supreme moments. God hides the kairos. Right in the Chronos, verse 35, verse 35, it says this, and when it grew late, it grew late, there's time again, when it grew late, his disciples came and said to him, it's a desolate place and it is now late. I think they wanted him to know it's late, twice in that verse, right? Send them away and go into the surrounding countryside and villages by themselves to get something to eat. So they got two problems here, right? The disciples are very cognizant of these two specific problems. First, they say, it's late. We got no more time. Jesus' son's gone down. People need to leave. The second thing was, though, there's about 5,000 men, probably about 15, 20,000 people with women and children. And so there's about 20,000 people there, and they're like, we can't feed all these people. Send them home, right? Let's move this on. So we've got a problem with time, not enough, and we got a problem with resource. Not enough. And if you're honest, I'm sure there's been moments in your life where you find that you don't have enough time, where you don't have enough resource. And in that moment, what do you do? See, most of us, if we're honest, in that moment, we start to get a little pit in our stomach, right? And that anxiety starts to come up, and you feel it right here, and everything gets tight. And you get anxious, and you start to scramble. Let me just, let me just try to fix it. Let me just try to fix it. Let me just, let me just try to fix it. You ever done that? We can ask your spouse later. I'm sure you have. Ask your friends later. I know I have. Look at how Jesus responds to their moment of anxiety. 
He just calms all their fears. Look what he says. And he answered them, you give them something to eat. Well, thanks a lot. And they said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it them to eat? In other words, 200 denarii, that's about eight months worth of their salary as a laborer, right? So they're like, listen, you're, I'm going to give my year's salary to pay all these people, uh, to eat, feed all these people. I can't do this. This is not a functional option, Jesus. This doesn't make any sense. What's the plan? We can't afford this. See, they were viewing this from a purely rational perspective, and God created our brains, so God is certainly not anti-rational. But he wants to get them to focus not just on what they lack, but on what they have. Look how the story goes. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? How many loaves do you have, I wonder? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish, not encouraging. 20,000 people, five loaves of bread. These are not like 37-foot loaves, okay? These are like little loaves of bread. Then he commanded them to all sit down in the groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by the hundreds and by the fifties. You probably know this story. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. He said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples and set before the people. And they divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Wow, what just happened here? This story doesn't make any sense. Of course, there is a supernatural miracle that goes on. They had more food at the end than they did at the beginning, right? Twelve baskets full of extra food, and so they only had five loaves, two fish, and somehow they see God multiply the food so that it feeds 20,000, and they end up with more than what they started with. This is amazing. Imagine the shock that the people were feeling, especially the disciples, like, what is happening right now? How is this possible? See, Jesus was teaching us specifically something about how to have a fruitful life. Because you and I, by nature, calculate things based upon human productivity, right? We go, well, it's going to be this many hours and this many days and this many weeks and this many, and that's going to take this and that's, and that's fine. God has invented all of those things and he's for them. But there's another level of calculation. There is divine calculation. Divine calculation that goes beyond human productivity, and that only is enacted when the person takes everything they have and gives it to Jesus. And we find here a third rule of time in regards to our productivity, and we'll call this rule the rule of divine productivity. And the rule of divine productivity says that when what you have is fully yielded to God, it multiplies. Oh, this is such a powerful rule. When what you have is fully yielded to God, it multiplies. When what you have is fully yielded to God, there is no telling how far what you have can go. We look at this evidenced in the life of Jesus. If you know much about the life of Jesus, you know he never left his home country. He never did a world tour. He never wrote down anything. People wrote about him. He never became famous all over the globe. He was one man from Nazareth, just a carpenter from Nazareth. He died outside the city of Jerusalem on a cross, a criminal's death. By every natural calculation, his life should have amounted to nothing. A blip on the screen of humanity. People just moving on. Think about the millions of millions of millions of people who have died through injustice throughout the course of human history. Certainly Jesus is just another name for the list, but this particular man was unlike any any other man. He lived his life perfectly and uniquely and divinely yielded to God. And so when he died on that cross, he gave God everything he had to wash away the sins of the world. And the power of that sacrifice was so profound that it raised him from the dead three days later so that his life could now be deposited in every single person who believes. And so he's now multiplied his divine life in my life and in yours. Come on, you got to see it, the law, this truth, this rule of divine productivity. When you have everything yielded to God, it multiplies. So you might be here today, 
and you say, Justin, if I'm honest, I am stressed out of my mind. I got five loaves and I got 5,000 men, and I don't know how this is ever going to work. Here is your solution. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus now. Put it all in his hands because today is your day for a miracle. In Jesus' name, he'll take an impossible circumstance and he'll provide an improbable solution. He's got a plan for you, but he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. The story's not done, though. Immediately, there's that verse we started with. He made his disciples, verse 45, get into the boat, go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After he'd taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. He went up on the mountain to pray. Now, this was very typical of Jesus. He was always disappearing to some place to pray. In fact, in Luke chapter 5, we are told that he would often withdraw to lonely places and pray. And it's interesting to me because I know for me, I have a tendency when I'm tired, when I'm exhausted, to just, you know, sit in front of a TV or, you know, look at some social media or just kind of fill my brain with nothing. And Jesus knew that that's not going to deeply refresh you. It's not going to satisfy you. What you need to do in moments of exhaustion is go to the mountain. You need to meet with God. You need to seek God alone. Pursue him and allow his spirit to refill your soul. And so that's what Jesus does here. And he models for us a life of utter dependence upon God. Think about that for a second. In our perspective, the son of God in flesh shouldn't need to be refueled. But he's limited himself to the human capacity. And in doing so, he requires refueling with the Father. And so we see Jesus, the son of God, living in absolute, radical, utter dependence upon God as Father. This is an amazing truth. King David in the Old Testament describes this dynamic between God and man, between God and woman, one-on-one. -on -one. And he describes it like a shepherd and a sheep, right? And many of us have probably heard Psalm 23, where David describes this relationship between himself and God. And he says, the Lord is my, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd. And he talks about this relationship. The Lord is my shepherd. See, a sheep is defenseless. A sheep is dependent. But a shepherd is strong. A shepherd protects. A shepherd, a shepherd guides. And this is what Jesus models for us. He lives dependent upon the Father. Now it's interesting that Mark records the story of the feeding of the 5,000, the story that we just read, and he intentionally, through this story, mirrors the movements of Psalm 23. Maybe you didn't notice it the first time I read it, but if I point it out, it might resonate. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus, it says in the story of Mark, had compassion on the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd, right? And then it says, I shall not want. That's the next part of Psalm 23. And Jesus says that they all ate until they were satisfied. He makes me lie down in green pastures. If you noticed, it says that Jesus commanded them, he commanded them to all sit down on the green grass. Mark even put the green in there, the green grass so that you could pick up on it. He leads me beside still waters. The next story in this text is when Jesus calms the storm, still waters. And then it says he restores my soul. He told the disciples to come away so that they could be restored and rest. It says he leads me in paths of righteousness. This is why he taught the people. And then it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, interestingly enough, historians tell us that this desolate area in Capernaum, where they were currently feeding the 5,000, was known as the shadow of death. That's what this area was called. It says he set a table before me. He set food before the people in this green grass. My cup overflows. Twelve baskets of leftover food was collected. There was an overflow of the blessing of God. And if you know the psalm, it ends with this statement, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we see that Mark's gospel records the story of the 5,000 being fed so that we could see, just as he mirrors Psalm 23, that that's the whole point of the story. That your time, don't miss this, your time on earth is not ultimately about you staying busy. 
It's not ultimately about your accomplishment or you becoming someone of notoriety. Your time on earth is not ultimately about you staying fascinated and entertained. Your time on earth is not ultimately about you having happy circumstances. If you're waiting for that, you're following the wrong leader. Jesus is not always going to make everything in your life happy, but your time on earth is about something else. Your time on earth at the core is about learning to walk with the shepherd, about learning to walk with the shepherd. And this is the model of Jesus. I can feel his presence in the room right now trying to get your attention. This is the point of the whole gospel. This is the call of your life. And we'll say it like this as the fourth rule of time. The fourth rule of time is the rule of first priority. And the rule of first priority says that life's greatest priority is to abide with the shepherd. Life's greatest priority. Now, there's a danger when we hear a message like this for people to go, amen. Amen. When's lunch, you know? <laughs> and miss something very, very important here. Because what we see is that this rule of first priority actually informs the other three rules that we just learned. And so if I'm ever going to embrace my own limits, I must live from the rule of first priority. If I'm ever going to see the Kairos moments buried in the Kronos of my life, I must live by the rule of first priority. If I'm ever going to experience divine productivity where the things in my life are multiplied in their impact, I must embrace this rule of first priority. And it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, 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 first priority. Yeah, God's first priority. No, 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 no. That's not what I said. I said that first priority is to live every moment abiding with the shepherd. So do something for me today. Just close your eyes for a second. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Everybody can participate. Close your eyes just for a moment. Imagine what your life would look like on Monday, tomorrow, if your first priority was not exercise, your first priority was not breakfast, your first priority was not that sale, your first central priority in life was how do I abide with the shepherd today? See how things start to change? And then what about Wednesday afternoon? What about Friday night? What about Saturday afternoon? What if every day of your life, the most important thing was not success in your business, was not harmony in your home. The most important thing was not the health of your children, but the most important thing was how do I live in step with the shepherd? If you can imagine that for a moment, you'll start to feel what I felt this week as I studied the text, that I'm not quite doing that. And Jesus invites us to today. You can open your eyes. Open your eyes. I want to give you two specific challenges, okay? Two specific challenges that'll get us on this road, that'll start the process of us thinking differently about our time, okay? And the first challenge is very, very simple. The first challenge is give the first part of your day this week, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the first part of your day every day this week, give to God. Give to God. Now, my challenge would be give the first hour of your day to God. But if you go, uh, then, then give the first 20 minutes. Give the first 30 minutes. Give the first 15 minutes. Give the first chunk of your day, not to breakfast, the first chunk of your day, not to exercise, the first chunk of your day, not to a shower and out the door, but wake up earlier. That's right, I said earlier. And seek God first. Seek God first. See, when you do that, you set the entire trajectory of your day. And you say, God I want to abide with you. When I'm busy at the office, when I'm rushing to lunch, when I'm crazy with meetings, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm buried in schoolwork, I want to be abiding with you. And so I'm going to give you the first part of my day. That's your first challenge. Maybe you already do that. If you do, then I would encourage you to expand that time. Expand that time. Do it for seven days and watch what happens in your life. Do it for seven days and you will find that an awareness begins to grow in you like you've never had before and awareness of God. Here's your second challenge. Your second challenge is pretty simple. Give 
God the first part of every week. The first part of every week. Now, Sunday, here we are, the first day of the week, and we give him the first part by participating in his family, the church. And so you've already done it this week. Well done. Good job. You're here. But if we're honest, many people, they don't make it to church every week. They make it to church a couple times a month. And you say, oh, Justin, I'm really busy. All right. All right. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to set you free. If you really want to be free, give him the first part of your week. It's a statement. It's a declaration of dependence upon God. You're saying, God, I need you to rule my calendar, and I'm going to give you the first part of my week. And if you're not involved here, then you haven't really become an active part of the family yet. And so I want to challenge you today to consider getting involved in the family of God. Many of you guys have heard about this at all of our locations, but I'm going to remind you about it today. As you open up your welcome pack, you'll find a little card that looks like this. See if you can find that. A little card that looks like this. It says City Church on one side. On the other side, it says First Serve. Here's how this works. First Serve. If you're here today and you're not serving yet as a part of the church, I want to invite you for your life, for your growth, and for your joy to become a part of our servant teams. Here's how this works. You're not making a lifetime commitment. You're not giving the next six years of your life. If you fill out the card today, drop it in the bucket before you go, one of our leaders at every one of our locations will call you this week and find a time where you can become a part of the servant team that runs these services one time. Not 15 times, not 20 times, one time. But it's a way for you to take that first step into getting to know some people here at the family of God and learning what it means to be a part of the family. I want to urge you, if you're not serving, I can promise you there is a place for you. There is a place for you, and we would love to help you find it and become a part of something bigger than yourself. And so fill this card out, drop it in the bucket before you leave. We'll call you, and we'll get you involved in serving the family of God. Just one time. What do you got to lose? Nothing. Nothing but a little bit of your time. But you'll gain it. You'll gain it, I promise, in life. Just stand to your feet at all of our locations. We're going to take a moment to pray, and then we're going to sing. The band is going to come out. I want to ask you just a simple question as we approach God today. What needs to change in your view of time? Come on, of all the things that was said today, let's just make it personal for a moment. What needs to change in your view of time? Are you rebelling against God's limits? Are you always trying to push, 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 push? That needs to change. You've got to come to him humbly today and say, God, teach me to surrender to your limits. If I'm living my life always exhausted, always pushing and rushing to the next thing, that's not God's best for you. And it's probably your own need to feel important through what you accomplish. Is your worth tied to what you produce? Because Christ says, tie your worth to the cross and you'll never need to produce to prove your value. I've already proven it by dying for your sins. Do you fully exist in the present or are you always distracted about the next thing? It's not wrong to plan, but it's wrong to disconnect from the present because you missed the Kairos moment. Are you living your life aware of God? Come on, let's pray today, and then we're going to sing, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to increase our awareness of Him, not just right now, but right now and tomorrow. Let's pray together. Spirit of Jesus, come. Spirit of Jesus, move. Wash across this room like a divine wave from heaven. For every heart that is cold or calloused, for every mind that is far bored or distracted, for every person that's been too busy to stop, I pray right now you calm the seas the winds and the waves within us. Speak the word that only you can. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord 
is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. We come again to surrender. In Jesus' name.